She was the perfect little angel baby. She was beautiful. I thought all my dreams had come true in life. On April 27, 1994, Lauren had her first series of vaccinations. And two hours after her vaccine, she had a five minute tonic clonic seizure. And it was in that moment that I was holding my daughter, I knew that my life was forever going to be changed. I was holding her out and I was looking at her and I became afraid of her. And this was my baby, she was six weeks old. And as I watched her body shake, I had never seen anyone have a seizure before. I remember the very first time that I was in the hospital and I just, my, I was stamping the floor and I remember holding on to the crib. I would just cry and I would scream inside and I didn't want this to happen to my child. My daughter had uncontrolled seizures her entire life. She was on as many as seven anti-seizure medications at one time. It wasn't a time that I could take out to kind of figure things out. I was just constantly chasing the next seizure, the next medication, and the next therapy. And so my life became filled with therapies. It was Children's Hospital, so there was the neurologist, and there were you know six other neurologists in training. And they all came in the office, in, in, in the room that I was sitting in, holding Lauren. And he took Lauren, and he laid her down, and he looked at me, and he said, Mrs. Kane, your daughter's going to be retarded. And I was just standing there in shock because at that point I had thought that hospitals were to fix your child. No one had ever talked about this. There was a lot of mention about seizures and kids grow out of them. But at that point, no one ever told me. What was obvious to everyone is that there was something seriously wrong with my baby. We just immediately went into denial. And then our second opinion was in about six weeks from that time. And the doctor took Lauren. She was still just four months old. He took her and he held her up and he said to me, he said, well, at least you will have a pretty retard and she won't do this. And then he started doing these weird jerking movements. And I stood there and I stood up against the wall and I watched him and I said, what? And he said, at least she'll be pretty and she won't do this. And I don't remember anything else about that day. I remember driving home with my husband in the car and it was pouring down rain. And it was devastating. I was just crying and we didn't talk. It was in that moment that we really separated on our coping skills. And I, I teased him and I said, well, let's just drive off the cliff as a family. And there was a part of me that was so serious. I didn't know in that moment that I could ever live with a child that would be labeled with the labels that I was getting from my daughter. I was not a strong person. I loved my child, but I didn't want to live a life that she would embarrass me. And I thought a lot about suicide. I thought a lot about family suicide. And we never really talked about it. He kind of just thought I was kidding or he was in his own hell. My third opinion, I was by myself and I was at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And I went and the team of doctors looked at me. They ne the neurologist never touched Lauren. He told me to go home and prepare for the worst. And so, of course, tears just started again, that familiar feeling. I was disheveled. I'm sure I looked horrible. I don't think that I was caring for myself at all at this point. I was up all night with Lauren having seizures, trying to shove medicine in her that was, um, of course, tasted horrible and it would just knock her out and then she would wake up to another seizure. And so I'm sure I looked at him with the broken hearted eyes of a mother and I said, when will I know? And he said, when she's a year old. What he said is that on Lauren's birthday, when she was a year old, I would know the fate of my child. And it was seven years every anniversary of her birthday. I think I started mourning in January, and her birthday was in March, and I would just wait for those months, anxiously hoping that something good would happen. And really not so much good happened with Lauren's early infant years. When she was one, she had no head control, no trunk control. She couldn't hold anything with her hands. She was making no vocal sounds. And somehow she was just the most adorable baby. I was losing everything that I thought I would ever have. Me and my husband immediately went on different paths. I went to support groups and he didn't. 
it was very difficult because at the end of the day, he would go to work all day and I would take care of his child. He would walk in the door and what am I going to say to him? Oh, your kid just had 20 seizures today and she's screaming all day and she's crying and, and there's no good news. The doctors say that, you know, she's never going to be okay. And I just started filtering. I started filtering from my family. I started filtering from him. I started um, filtering from everybody because I never got good news. I kicked and screamed. I used to go to work in the beginning because I thought I could still work. And I would just lay my head down on my desk. And I remember just having my head down and I could see my boss's feet um, walking across and no one said anything. The fact that she took 24 seven care didn't really register to me until she was five and I had a nervous breakdown. Because it's very difficult when you have a child who's so demanding because of course my job is her mother and so I should be doing what she needs as her mother to take care of her. She had just had a trach and she was turning blue and she had pneumonia constantly and so I was suctioning her, suctioning her, changing her. She had an IV in her arm which meant more medical attention and I was doing this IV pick change on my own. I was doing G-tube changes. I was doing every single procedure. Um, basically in my home because taking her out at that point was not an option because she was turning blue sometimes till she passed out. I couldn't leave the room and I couldn't leave her but because I was her mother I thought that was my job to take care of her. We put her in a coma twice to stop the seizures when she was three years old. Her, her third birthday she spent 17 days in the ICU and that was the first time we had really been in the ICU for a life or death life or death moment. The doctors basically told me to 911 your family, your daughter's dying. I had to call her father and I say, you know, Lauren is going to die unless we intubate her. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to intubate her at all. I had spent the first three years with this baby screaming and crying, you know, putting medication in her, doing um, steroid injections in her leg that was this big and I felt that her life was a living hell. My life was certainly a living hell. So in that pivotal moment where we had to make that decision, do you save your child's life or do you let her go? I was, I was ready to let her go. I called her dad and he said, do everything. And I was, I really was disappointed that he was choosing that, but I couldn't argue with him. So on that day, we intubated Lauren for the first time. And that started a two-year effect of living in the hospital. We lived in the hospital from three to five. I never left her side. And she had numerous intubations. She had a trach. She had a tracheal diversion. She had a G-tube. She had her hips rebuilt. She had a rod put in her spine. She had her tonsils out. She had tubes put in her ears. She had a vagal implant put in her to help her stop her seizures twice. I was like every other mother and had dreams for my daughter and her life, her future. I would think about what she would do when she grew up, who she would date, what we would argue about. Of course, thinking about her wedding day and how she would make me proud in life. And Lauren was robbed of all that by her vaccine injury. Vaccine injury devastates families.